Masechet Sotadaf Zayin. Today we have a couple of Mishnayot about the pr- procedure of bringing the Sota to the Bet HaMikdash and then the warnings that the Sanhedrin would tell her. So Mishnah teaches, Kesad ose la, modicha lebet din shebeoto makom, umosrin lo shete shene tamidech hachamim, shema yavo aleha baderech. Rebi Uda Omer, ba'ala neman aleha. So once she be, once she is declared a Sota, um, uh, the husband and uh, warns her and she is uh, found to have been secluded and there's a witness or two witnesses to see that. What do we do next? Uh, they bring her to the Bet Din, the local Bet Din in the city that they live. And that Bet Din will appoint two sages to accompany the husband and the wife so on their journey to Yerushalayim. The Sotah ritual has to be done and the Sanhedrin that uh, sits in the Lishkat HaGazit um, on on Harabait, and so it has to be done there and only there. Uh, so they have to go. They have to get there. Now they don't want to send the husband and wife alone because um, the husband and wife are not allowed to be together. They're not not allowed to have relations. And so we worry if they're going to go and travel, and who knows how long, uh, how far away they live. Maybe they have to. You know, maybe it's uh, more than one night. And so we worry because they are, after all, husband and wife. And even though the husband was angry and suspicious and whatever, still he, they, he may desire her on the way. And then they may be together and that would be a problem, not allowed to be together. So we give, send, send them chaperones to Tamidech Amim to be chaperones. Um, we saw uh, previously that in the Bet Hamikdash itself, you have the the young Kohanim would be their guardians. Uh, but until they get there, it's the Tamidech Chachamim. As Tanakama, Rabbi Yudah Amel Baala Neiman Aleh. Rabbi Yudah says, "No, you don't have to send guardians. We can trust the husband uh, uh, that he's that they're not gonna uh, be together after the husband is the one that started this whole process and is jealous and accused her, and so um, we don't. They don't need guardians. Okay, Gemara." So now we have this woman with her husband and two other um, sages. So that's three men all together and one woman. Oh, so we can use this Mishnah to clarify a law regarding Yichud. It says in the Mishnah in Kiddushin that um, uh, if you have one woman with two men, then that's not Yichud because uh, two men uh, will guard each other and make sure, uh, you know, if one starts to do something wrong, the other one will stop him, warn him, they'll be ashamed of each other. Um, so that's in generally too, true. On that Mishnah Kiddushin, Rav clarified and said, that's only true if you're in the city, then two men will guard each other not to sin with one woman. But if you're going on a journey, then it's not sufficient to have two. You need three men because if you have only two, and let's say one of them has to go to the bathroom. If you're on the journey, so the bathroom means, you know, you're going out on the side of the road. So one is gonna go, one's going to go into the forest uh, somewhere and leave uh, one man and one woman uh, on, the, on, the, on the road. And then that's a problem. In the city, this is not a problem because in the city, there's bathrooms that are close by. And so, um, you know, you can find other people. Uh, maybe he's going to come back any second. But out in the road, he's going to have to go far off to find some bush out in the, in the, in the trees and, um, and uh, leave them for a significant amount of time with nobody else around. Um, uh, so if, right, if you have only two and one leaves, then you'll have one, with, and that'll be Yichud with an Ayrva. So we can prove from our Mishnah, this is a support for the statement of Rav, because now Mishnah says you have to send the husband uh, with two other people on the road, um, so they need three altogether, and this is also that's that's exactly what I've said. On the road, you need three people. So, so do we have a good proof from our Mishnah to the halacha that I've taught? And we say no, not necessarily. Here we're sending two sages so that the sages can serve as witnesses. If the husband should try to do something, then these two uh, the, these two sages will give him a warning. Don't you know this? 
place is prohibited. If you do this, the sotah waters won't work, right? And they'll tell him the consequences. And if he does sin, then they will be witnesses against him, uh, which, we, which we would need for the, that those further consequences. Um, okay, so that's why we have two. And this, special, this is a special case when we need two as witnesses. It doesn't mean that Rav is necessarily true that if it was not a case of sotah and you just have to, you're just traveling, um, in that case, maybe two would be enough and not necessarily three. And so now we further uh, um, d- derive something from the Mishnah. The Mishnah said that you need two Tamidech Chamim, not just the regular people. Um, um, this seems to support a different statement that I've said. Also, in the context of Yichud, uh, Rav Yudah, the name of Rav, Rav, taught that when you say you're allowed to have two men and one woman together, and that's not Yichud, they'll guard each other, that's only if those people are moral, morally fit. But if they are loose, immoral people, then even ten people are not going to guard each other, right? Ten people who are all of loose morals, um, uh, no one's going to stop each other, and no one's going to be embarrassed from each other. And in fact, there was such a story that there were ten men that carried out a woman on mitah. Um, this could be like a palanquin, they're carrying her out, or maybe a beer, like a coffin, making believe she's dead. Uh, whatever it is, they, ca- they carried her out, and somewhere on the way, they sinned. Um, and see, even though it was ten people, nobody stopped each other. So ten uh, people, uh, immoral people, uh, is still going to be yichud. So do we have a proof from here that the fact it says tamidecha chamim specifically? And we say la hacha hainu tamadiyad el aturiyebe. Here, the reason why you need tamidecha chamim is that they'll know how to warn him properly. They'll know the uh, the proper halachot. Um, listen, they told the husband, you know, if you are with your wife, then these will be the consequences. Um, if he does sin, they'll be, they'll be, they'll testify, as we saw just before. But even before he sins, um, you want him, they want them to be able to stop him. And so you need sages that are sufficiently respected and knowledgeable to give that proper warning. Good. Rabbi Uda Omer Ba'alaz. And Rabbi Uda disagreed with Tanakama. And he said, no, you don't have to send escorts. The husband is trusted. Tanya, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Ba'ala Neeman Bikal Vachomer, Ma Nida Shehi Becharet? Ba'ala Neeman Aleha Sota Shehi Belav, Lo Kol Sheken. Rabbi Yehuda says that the husband is uh, trusted, and he learns this from a Kal Vachomer. Regarding Enida, um, uh, the uh, husband is believed, even though that is a prohibition of Karet. In other words, a regular married couple, um, uh, whenever his wife is nida, we don't say that, oh, you can't be alone together, you can't be in the same room together, right? We allow a husband and wife to still uh, live together in the same house, in the same room, um, uh, while she's nida, and we trust him, right? That, nothing, that he's not going to violate nida, um, and we trust him even though that's a very serious prohibition, right? If someone's with a nida, that's a prohibition of karet. So sota, if a husband is with his sota wife, that's only that prohibition is only a love. So all the more so, he should be trusted uh, on the way. Uh, so therefore, we don't need any um, uh, any uh, uh, to send any uh, sages together with them. Okay, Rabbanan, Rabbanan, what are you going to do with this? In that good kavachomer, and Rabbanan say no, the opposite. He hanotenet. The fact that it's karet actually is, makes it, it turns the logic the opposite way. Precisely because the prohibition of Nida is so stringent, it's karet, so people are going to be careful. Oh, I'm not going to be with my wife when she's Nida, that's going to be karet. But sota, because it's a lower prohibition, so people aren't going to be so careful about it. Right, you have a lot of people that eat pig, they're never going to eat pig, but some, you know, lower prohibition, so then they won't be as careful um, of it. And so uh, the, this Kava Chomer does not work, it's the other way around. Okay, so that's uh, one. That all that was uh, was uh, one baraita. It's found in the Tosefta. Okay, so that's baraita A. Now we're going to quote another baraita. Uh, it's going to be a little different. Wait, does Biuda really learn his law from a kava the one that we had just just now? Uh, that, does he learn that the husband is trusted from a kava In the following baraita, we're going to see that the Biuda derives it from a pasuk and does not a kava chomer. So which one is it? We're going to have to resolve these two baraitot. Okay, this baraita is uh, long. Uh, 
and uh, quotes a number of opinions. Uh, this is the first opinion of Tanakama, who quotes a pasuk. Rebuta is going to quote the same pasuk. We're going to see at the end of this baraita that the husband brings the wife to the Kohen. So the Torah couldn't be clearer. The husband brings the wife, um, he alone. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about having to bring an escort. However, it's the sages, Mitrabanan, they said, we give them two Talmidech Chachamim because we don't trust them. So, uh, all you need, from Deoraita level, you're right, that's all you need. So, that's Tanakama, Kunta Tanakama, yes, you do need escorts, but it's a Drabanan requirement. Rabbi Yose says, the husband is trusted. He brings the same Kavachomer we saw above in the name of Rabbi Uda, that the husband um, is trusted regarding a Nida, his wife Nida, um, and that's Karet, and still he's trusted, all the more so Sota, which is a lower level prohibition, he should be trusted to be alone with her. And so the sages here respond to that Kavachomid in a different response, right? They break the Kavachomid by saying, no, it's not the same. With regarding a nida, they are, they are going to be permitted, right? Don't worry about it. Even though the husband and wife are together and she, he, he's, uh, um, she's nida, the husband will say to himself, listen, I'll just wait all right, uh, a week or two and then my wife will be permitted to me. So I'm not going to sin now. If I could just be, if I could be per- permitted. Um, however, sota, which may not have a heted, I mean, it's possible that she will drink and be innocent, and then yes, they'll be per- permitted. Or, but it could be that um, she she will drink and be found to be guilty, and then th- this his wife will never be permitted to him. And psycho- psychologically, this pasuk in, in Mishle teaches that stolen waters are sweeter uh, than uh, than not stolen, right? Pre- precisely because it's prohibited, that will want him, that will make the husband want to sin. Um, and so, be, pre- because the sota, there's not a guaranteed end uh, of the prohibition, so then we have to suspect that he's, he, he may violate uh, the law and uh, be with his sota wife more likely than with his uh, nida wife, because nida wife surely will become permitted um, uh, uh, in uh, so, soon uh, soon after. Okay, so therefore that the kavachomer does not work. Okay, oh that was Rabbi Yose and uh, and uh, the chachamim's disagreement with Rabbi Yose. Now we get to what we've been waiting for. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Mina Torah Ish Mevi Et Ishto El Akohen Shenemar Vehbi Ha'ish Et Ishto. Rabbi Yehuda says, No, it's from the Torah. I don't have to bring a kavachomer. It's a clear pasuk. I don't have to add any drabanan. The Torah says the husband brings his wife. So that's it. It's very clear. Um, so that's the end of the Braita. And now this is our question. In the first Braita, above the Buda brought a Kavachomer to teach me that the husband is trusted. And here he doesn't bring Kavachomer. He just says, here, this is the Pasuk in the Torah. So which one is it? And the answer is, Amalu Kavachomer Beresha Ufarchu. The answer is, we can reconcile both Badaitot. The first Badaita was the earlier one in which Rabbi Yehuda offered a Kavachomer. However, the sages disproved it. So then, he didn't have a Kavachomer. So he says, okay, I, don't, I still hold by my opinion. I'm just going to stick with the Pasuk by itself. And uh, so the second, um, uh, the second Braita is his later uh, presentation. Rabbi Yehuda Hainu Tanakama. Now we ask about the second Braita. It looks like Rabbi Yehuda is the same as the Tanakama. They both both bring the same pasuk to teach me that Medoraita, uh, the husband is trusted. Ikaban Benayu Aval Amiru. There's a difference, however. Tanakama said, however, the say that Tanakama added the. The Rabbanan prohibition uh, that we don't trust him, that we the requirement that we have to send two scholars. And the Biuda disagrees with Tanakama and says, no, the Doraita law is all there is. There is no Dirabanan requirement for two scholars to be sent with them.
All right, and now next Mishnah, we continue the procedure. And so they would bring her up. It was literally up to Harabait, but also up in Kedusha when you make Aliyah. It's not only Aliyah from Chutzaras to Eretz Yisrael, but within Eretz Yisrael to Yerushalayim, to Harabait. And they go to the Betin, the, the, the Sanhedrin, in Yerushalayim. Uh, it's on the Temple Mount in, Hara, in Lishkata Gazit. And they will intimidate her the same way um, uh, witnesses are intimidated or warned regarding capital cases. Regarding capital cases, says in Mishnah, Sanhedrin, that the, the, the judges tell the witnesses, listen, don't you know if you're lying in a capital case, then and that you know, the, the defendant um, is killed by capital punishment because of you, then you are responsible for his life and the life of all the descendants of him, and one life is equal to the entire world, so you're destroying the entire world by doing that. Okay, we really um, uh, uh, we really uh, uh, threaten them and scare them to, to understand that how serious it is um, if, if that they should not be lying. Okay, now this is different. This is... Um, they're uh, uh, um, not the same uh, riot act that we tell the Eded Nefashot, but rather in a similar way, we're going to tell the woman, right, don't you know how serious this is, and therefore you should admit to your sin if you were guilty. Um, and Ve'omerla, Biti, Harbe Yain Ose, Harbe Sehok Ose, Harbe Yaldut Osa, Harbe Shechanim Haraim Osin. And we, uh, in order to encourage her to uh, admit, we, we tell her, listen, we understand that there are circumstances that influence you. And wine does a lot of things. And also levity and immaturity. Maybe she's a young person and pe- people are young. They don't make the, always the best decisions. And uh, neighbors, sometimes neighbor, they, they, they chatter, they put bad ideas in, in your mind. And so, you know, it, it's understandable that um, because of these various external uh, reasons, uh, 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 bad decisions can happen. So, in other words, don't be embarrassed to admit. Or on the one hand, we're kind of uh, we're being very strict and scary, like you know, look how terrible this is. This is. On the other hand, we wanna we wanna be understanding that there are circumstances that uh, would lead you to this, and we'll take that into account. Um, do it for the uh, for the sake of God's great name uh, that's written in holiness, so that should not be erased in the water. Because if she does not admit, then they're going to have to write down the parashat sota on kelaf, and then with has Hashem's name in it, and they're going to erase it, and the ink they, they dissolved into the water that she drinks. And so part of the process is, is, is erasing God's name. And so admit now rather than have to have God's name erased because of you. And we tell her things that should not be heard, not by her and not by her family. The Gemara is going to explain what types of things we say that uh, are we generally we wouldn't say we'd be we'd be uh, it would be inappropriate to say in uh, in in public, um, but yet we say them in order to drive home this point that she should. Admit if she's guilty. If she admits after all that, yes, I sinned with that other person, I committed adultery, then um, she loses her ketubah and she is divorced. All right, so that's the um, uh, th- that's uh, uh, that's the worst that happens to her because um, uh, she's admitting after all. There are not two witnesses that saw so uh, that saw her. Um, so based on her admission, she forfeits. If she says no, she insists that she is innocent, then we go ahead with the procedure and we bring her up to the eastern gate at the entrance of Shad Nikanor. So this is going from the east, right? This would be looking into Kodesh Kodashim, which is behind these Nikanor gates. And we take her up to here, um, which is the place not only where the sota ritual is done, it's also um, uh, where the uh, Yoledet, a woman who gave birth um, after, after she becomes 
uh, pure, and after whatever, 40 days or 80 days, uh, she comes here um, to finish her tahada process. Also, a misora um, has to come at this point to finish his tahada process. Vechohen ochez bivgadeha. Im nikreu nikreu, im nifremu nifremu. Ajahu megale et libah vesoter et seada. And now she is publicly shamed. It's publicly shamed, even though she actually may be innocent. Um, but she did, at least after a warning, uh, seclude herself with someone. So, uh, so there some some public shaming is is uh, is uh, is deserving. And so he uh, the kohen will grab onto her garment and pull it and uh, pull it indiscriminately um, as, and such that um, if it's torn, it's torn, or if the stitches come apart, one would be like a bigger tear than another, right? However, however it is, and he tears it until her heart is uh, exposed, meaning her chest is exposed, and also dishevels her hair. Um, uh, that might mean uncovers her hair, unbraids her hair. Uh, this is relevant for uh, to understand what, how did married women usually have their hair? Was it usually covered, braided? What does that mean? Anyway, the point is it's disheveled and, and, and uh, she's publicly shamed. Rabbi Uda is concerned that if she is beautiful and her, her chest is beautiful or her hair is beautiful, then people that are there um, that will, will be looking and then they will, uh, they, will, uh, they will arouse their desire. And then for, you know, you're trying to, to stop one uh, case of adultery, and that might arouse thoughts of other people, and so that we, we would we would not want that. And therefore, if she is beautiful, we would not reveal her chest, and we would not um, undo her hair, according to the Biuda. If she was wearing white, we would cover her with black. In other words, like a not a not fancy garment. White would be a fancy garment. We cover her with black so that she looks disheveled. If she had uh, uh, um, uh, uh, jewelry, chokers, nose rings, finger rings, we remove them so that she would not be attractive. And then after we tear the clothes, as this Mishnah is a little bit out of order, if she's wearing nice white clothing, then she changes into black clothing, right? Uh, not nice clothing. And then that's what we tear. After we tear it, the problem is then it's not going to stay on, right? Because it's, it's torn at, at, at the shoulders. And so we don't, we don't want her dress to fall off. So we um, uh, tie this Egyptian rope um, above her chest to keep it, um, to keep it uh, on. Um, okay, so she should be shamed, but she's, there's not supposed to be have no clothes on. Anybody, we make this a big public affair, and anyone who wants to come and watch can watch except for her servants and maidservants because she will be emboldened by them. This is her supporters. And, you know, if she's like, you know, up there on trial and she sees the, the, those who love her, um, uh, this and, and slaves are devoted to her. So then that's going to give her confidence to go ahead and not admit. And we don't want that. Where well, we want this, the main point of this whole ceremony is to scare her to the extent that she will admit if she's guilty, not that she should admit if she's not guilty, right? But there is enough evidence to, there is some evidence that she is guilty. And so we want to push her to admit the guilt and that'll be a better outcome. Okay, and so um, the maidservants cannot be there. And in fact, although anyone can come the, to watch, the women are particularly encouraged to watch because of the Pasuk in Yechezkel, that all women may, may be taught not to do after the lewdness, that the women should see this and see an example um, and not behave in the same way. All right, that's the Mishnah. Minah we ask, um, how do we know that the um, sota is brought in front of the Sanhedrin? Maybe it's in front of a local court. Amar Torah Torah. 
את כל התורה, וכתיב התם על פי התורה אשר יורוך, מה להלן ב-71, אף כאן ב-71. It says the word Torah in two contexts. In the context of the Sota, it says, the Kohen will do to her, to her all of the Torah, meaning the laws, the procedures that are written there in Sota. And uh, in Devarim, when it's talking about the Zaken Mamre um, and the Sanhedrin, how you have to follow what the Sanhedrin says, it says Al Torah based on the teachings that the Sanhedrin will, will, uh, um, uh, will um, uh, rule, uh, one must follow. So just like there, it's uh, the, the Sanhedrin of 71 sages, so to here, it has to be the Sanhedrin of 71 sages. aleha, And they are going to threaten her. Now in the Mishnah, it only says that we um, uh, intimidate her so that she will admit, right? And then therefore not drink. So we intimidate her only one way, it seems, right? Encouraging and scaring her so that she will admit guilt. But then in this Baraita, it says two ways. Just like we um, uh, intimidate her so that she admits guilt and doesn't drink, we also um, intimidate her that she should drink. Um, in other words, like if you're innocent, then go ahead and drink, right? And nothing bad will happen to you. So, you know, we're in the coin to this Baraita, we're encouraging her to go ahead and do whatever she knows is the truth, and don't be scared of drinking if she's innocent. As it says, uh, the Brayta continues, Omrim la, beti, im barul lach hadavar, she teora'at, im di abur yech ushti, lefi she'en maim amarim domin, ela lesam yabesh shemunach al abasan chai, im yesh sham maka mechal chel, veyored, im en sham maka, eh, no mo'il kelum. The judges tell her, right, my, uh, my our daughter, they say it in a, in, in a, in a nice and endearing way, if it's clear to you that you are innocent, then stand upon your clarity that you know you're innocent and drink because this, uh, the, the bitter waters of the sota are like a, um, a, 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 like a, a medicine that, that you put, um, uh, like a dry, po- dry poison that you put on a flesh wound. If there is a wound there, then this dry poison, it will go into the wound and it will penetrate and do its work. Um, and if there, but if there's no wound, then nothing will happen at all, right? If you put dry poison on, on, uh, on healthy flesh, then it'll just wash off and nothing will happen. Only if you put poison in a wound, then it will penetrate and harm the person. And the same thing is with the, uh, the sota waters. If someone is guilty, then it's like poison. It will go in and it will cause their death. But if someone is innocent, then the, it's, just, it's, just like, it's just like drinking water. It's just like putting something on top of your uh, healthy skin. It just falls right off. Nothing will happen to you. Go ahead and prove your innocence if you really know that you are innocent. And basically, it's like we're emphasizing this is a lie detector test, right? It's, it's 100% accurate. And therefore, right, if you're guilty, better tell us now because this, uh, this is a, um, a lie detector test that also electrocutes you if you're, in, if you're guilty, right? But if you're innocent, then don't you have nothing to worry about. Uh, nothing bad will happen to you. We don't want her to say, oh, I'm too scared. Even though I know I'm innocent, I'm too scared to drink it because it's a scary drink. And I don't want it. And then if she doesn't drink, she'll be prohibited, remain prohibited to her husband. We don't want that either. And so we want to balance out according to the Braita. So how do we reconcile this with the Mishnah that it says only one side of the equation? Oh, it depends when. The Mishnah was talking about before they wrote the scroll and erased it. So before they erased God's name, then we want to emphasize that she should uh, admit guilt. If she's guilty, admit guilt because we don't want to have to erase God's name. However, after she, after all that, we gave her all those admi- uh, uh, um, admonitions and she still didn't uh, um, uh, admit. So then we write the name, we erase the name. Once God's name is already erased, so now uh, there's, no, uh, there's no further downside. Um, so now she's ready to drink. We have the drink ready. So now we want to tell her, okay, listen, if you're, if you're guilty, still time to admit. And if not, okay, go ahead and drink. Because the drink is all ready, 
and we're not we're not going to have to do anything um, uh, negative further to prepare the drink. All right, Vilmer lefaneha, and the judges tell her things that are not that are not usually said in public, and we say that in front of her and in front of her family. So, what are these things that we say? Tanora banan omer lefaneh devarim shel hagadal masim sheru beketuvim arishonim kegon asher chachamim yagidu velo chichadu me avotam. We tell them agadot, and we tell them uh, stories that from the from, from the ketubim adishonim. We talk, we give them stories from the from the neviim, from Tanakh, um, and um, other pesukim from ketubim. For example, a pesuk in Yov that says um, that wise men told and did not hide from their fathers. In other words, in the olden days, when someone did something wrong, they didn't hide it from their fathers. Even someone who who, who was who was um, uh, sinned, they would admit their guilt. In other words, you are not the first one to ever sin, right? Be embarrassed. Yes, you should be embarrassed. But recognize that you you're in company and people who were in your situation before who did even terrible sins, but even the greatest people have, have, uh, uh, were not perfect. But after they, after they sinned, they admitted their guilt, and you should follow, therefore, in their, in, in their example, and see the benefit of admitting guilt. Yehuda, Hoda, Velo, Bosh. Yehuda, he was with a Zona, and, um, and it was uh, Edva, it was his daughter-in-law, and um, he didn't tell anyone, and then he was about to burn his own daughter-in-law because she uh, became pregnant but then right she said you know who to, to whom belongs these items and Yehuda admitted his guilt yes it was me Sadekami Meni and he was not embarrassed um, he could have easily just kept quiet and not even been embarrassed he admitted guilt and because of that he inherited life of the world to come Yehuda right is the head of the nation Nobody better. Reuven did something with Bilha, his uh, stepmother. Um, and so here, right, the, the p- simple reading is that he slept with her. Uh, the Midrashic reading is that he just switched the beds. Um, uh, so um, assuming that she, he sinned, um, we, he, he, but he, then he admitted his guilt. And what happened? Um, uh, because of that, he got rewarded. We ask, and what was their reward? And then we ask about that question. What do you mean? Why are you asking what was their reward? We just said, they get Olam Haba. No, we want to know further their reward, not only in the world to come. We want to know what was their reward further in this world. And the answer is, To them alone was given in the land, no stranger uh, passed ama- among them. Right, Yehuda was given the kingship, and he was given his his land. And Reuben got the uh, section on the other side of the Jordan, and then their land was secure, and they didn't have to worry about foreigners coming and taking it from them. And so you see, even though they did terrible sins, but they are the greatest of the of, of our patriarchs. And what's great about them is that they admitted their guilt and then everything was good afterwards. So even if you sinned, don't think you're the first one to ever in the world to ever sin. The right thing to do now is to admit guilt and then everything will be okay. Okay, amazing. Now, Bishlama bi Yehuda ashkachan de ode dichtiv vayaked Yehuda vayomer sadeka mi meni elad oben minelan de ode. Okay, now if we go back and look at those stories in Bereshit, we on Yehuda we see that where he admitted right um, when he's challenged, Yehuda recognized the items um, that Tamar had, and he said, "She is righteous. She is right. I am in the wrong. I'm I sinned." We see that he admits. But Oven, where does it ever say that he admitted his guilt? We learn it from the from the fact that. Um, in the Berachot, that it says at the end of Devarim, uh, and this is in Vezot HaBeracha, um, first says, Yechid Uben, Uben should live and not die. Vezot Yehuda, the Beracha for Yehuda, comes right after with a Vav connecting them, right? And so by connecting them, it says, right, why, why they connected? Just like Yehuda admitted his guilt, so too Reuven admitted his guilt, and because of that, he was able to live and not die. 
כל אותן שנים שהיו סביב המדבר, היו עשמות של יהודה מגול גלין בארון עד שעמד משה וביקש עליו רחמים. And now back to יהודה. All the days that the Jewish people were in the desert, the bones of Yehuda, that uh, since he, was, he died and he was buried in, in Egypt, when B'nai Yisrael left in the time of Moshe, they took the bones of Yehuda along with them. But the bones is his bones because he, of these, of this uh, um, uh, his negative past um, were rolling around. They were not attached um, to each other. And this is uh, you know, disgraceful for his body. And um, uh, so they're rolling around in the coffin, Ad uh, 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 really literally rolling in his grave. Ad um, until Moshe said, this is not good, not appropriate, Yehuda is a good person. And so you, Moshe prayed for Yehuda. Um, uh, uh, Moshe said, who caused the Uven to uh, admit Yehuda, in other words, once Yehuda admitted and uh, Reuven saw, oh, that's what I should do, right? If you do something wrong, you should admit your guilt. That prompted Reuven to say, you know what, I'm also going to admit my guilt. Look how Yehuda was a good example for others. And how do we know that? Look how they're connected. Vezot Yehuda. Reuven followed what Yehuda did. Miyad Shema Hashem Kol Yehuda Ve'al Ebre Le'Shafa So immediately Moshe said that Hashem listened to the cries of Yehuda and the bones and, uh, uh, got, come, came together into their sockets and they were reassembled and no longer rolling around. But then, even though he wasn't rolling around, still, they didn't allow him into the heavenly yeshiva, right? Because if still he had a stain of sin with him, and then not allow him. So Moshe prayed more. And then after he prayed, he was brought unto his people. His people means all the rest of the, uh, of the uh, heavenly body of uh, people that are up in heaven studying Torah. He was allowed into yeshiva to join them. But even when he was able to enter into the Bet Midrash Shel Ma'ala, he didn't know how to deliberate, to argue back and forth um, with the sages. He, kind of, he lost his skill in debate. And so uh, Moshe prayed for him and Yadav Rav, Rav liked to, to fight but not physically fighting. It means in the study of Torah. And then he was able to once again uh, uh, um, argue his points. Uh, but still, even though he was able to fight his points, he was unable to come to the halachic con- proper halachic conclusion. Um, he, lost that, he lost that ability. So Moshe prayed for him as also, um, and uh, uh, you should be a help against it ad- as adversaries. And then you know, that was able not only to argue but argue successfully um, to for the for a, halach, a halachic conclusion. A fascinating midrash. Of course, the rabbis when they think of olam haba, what's better than doing forever what they love doing here? Now, what's better than learning Torah all the time? And what's their biggest fear? Right, the same fears that one has in this world that you're going to not be allowed into the bet midrash. You're not going to get into the you know the top yeshiva that you want to get into, or you're going to be there and you're not going to know what's going on. You won't be able to argue. You won't be able to be convincing um, to your to to your colleagues. Um, and so, right, this really does reflect the um, social pressures. Uh, that existed in the um, rabbinic Bet Midrash as in the Yeshiva Shema'la. Now, Bishlama Yehuda de Ode ki hechi de la tisaref tamar. El Roben Lama le de Ode. Hamar Rav Sheshat Hasif Alai dim faret hatate. We understand Yehuda why he admitted, uh, because he had to admit in public. Um, because uh, Tamar was about to be burnt, and he had to, in order to stop Tamar, who actually was innocent from being burnt, he admitted in public, oh, it was me, I am in the wrong. But Uvan, why did he admit in public? He should have admitted in private. Listen, I did something with uh, my, my stepmother's bed. Um, why do you have to announce it in public? And Ef Shashat, after all, uh, said that someone who, who, um, uh, uh, who uh, uh, details the sins in public, that's brazen. It looks like he's almost boasting about it. Hey, everybody, you know what I did? Right, listen to this. Right? Who wants to know that? Admit it to the, either to the, um, the, the party 
if it's a private sin, admit it to the person that was offended, admit it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You don't have to publicize something that was not done in public. And so the answer is, And they did it so that the brothers uh, would not suspect of uh, him having committed the deed. Right? There were some rumors and he wanted to settle all rumors. Listen, in case whatever you heard, Right here, uh, here is the truth. This is exactly what I did. I admit to it. I apologize. I won't do it again, and so on. We can understand now what the Mishnah meant when it says that we say things that are not appropriate to be said in front of her and her family. Uh, Rambam here uh, explains that um, uh, we uh, we tell them the episodes of Yudan Tamar, Uben and Bila, Amnon and Tamar as written in the Bible. In other words, usually when we read this or teach this in public, we do it based on the um, Targum um, or, or the Midrash, or we don't read the Targum because we want to soften the, um, the, the full impact, uh, the full extent of the sins, right? These are our great um, uh, patriarchs, and so we want to put them in the best light. You also don't want to talk about terrible things they did. People say, oh, if even uh, that great person did a, a bad thing like that, then I'll do it too. So we don't want to encourage that. And so therefore we soften the behavior. However, that's what that's the purpose of the Midrash or of not reading the Targum. However, in the case of Sota, it's the opposite. We want to tell the Sota, listen, right? You, you should learn from the example of examples of others. And therefore we read it as it's written, without any Midrash, without any sugarcoating. We read the Pesukim as they are and say, listen, look at this great person who who did a sin similar to your sin but what happened after they admitted their guilt they owned up to it they made teshuva and everything was okay after and so too you should do that will be understanding right there's uh, bad influences maybe your neighbor said something maybe it was because you were too young and immature and so on um, and so that's a combination of uh, both uh, scare tactics but also encouragement for the person to make teshuva. All right, so I think that is very interesting. And you see, uh, at least according to Rambam, uh, the role of public recitation, the Midrash, Targum, and the uh, Peshat also has a role to play in a case like this. Okay, finally, Imam Rat Temeani, if she did admit, then the Mishnah says that she loses her ketuva. It said uh, to lose her ketuva, it says shoveret et ketuvata. The word shoveret means shovar, a receipt. So shemat mina kotvin shovar. That means that she writes a receipt to say, I, um, uh, to say, I, you don't have to pay me my ketuva, right? Um, this is a, a general law. Um, let's say in a regular case of divorce or whatever, um, or, or death, that the husband, if he pays the ketubah, or the state pays the ketubah, and she receives it, so she writes a receipt. Just like you would do in any loan, if it's paid up, you write a receipt, I received my ketubah, you don't have to pay it anymore. And so we can learn from here, since this Mishnah uses the word shovedet, which means not just that she loses her ketubah, but that she writes a receipt, that means you should write a receipt. Now, this is subject to a machloket in Baba Batra. Do you write receipts or do you not write receipts? And so we can learn from here that, yes, you should write a receipt. Um, this makes a difference because if, if you expect that you write receipts and then the husband doesn't produce the receipt, you say, oh, well, where's your receipt? It must be you didn't pay, right? So this makes a big difference. Amar mekara'at. says, not necessarily. Maybe you should uh, read the Mishnah as saying or as meaning that you tear the ketubah, right? You have the ketubah and you tear it like a loan document that you tear up then. It cannot be used ever again to be collected. So not necessarily true that you write a receipt. Amal Rava v'ha shovedet ketani. Rava says, said, we write the text of the, the oral text of the Mishnah is shovedet, which means write a receipt, not mekarat. You can't just go change the word. Ela amal Rava b'makom shen kotvin ketubah skina. Rava says, no, you can, still can't learn anything from this Mishnah because Mishnah can be assuming a place where the custom was not to write a ketubah. For all weddings, the rabbi said, listen, we institute that every man is obligated to ketubah stipulations and therefore you don't even have to write it even if you don't write it you're obligated under the ketubah because they don't actually write ketubot for every wedding but assume assume it therefore there's nothing to rip up uh, so if you're in a living in a place where 
um, they write they 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 writing uh, they write a ketuba uh, there. Um, it's possible that you could just um, uh, that you would that you could just rip it up and you don't have to write a receipt. But if you're living in a place where they don't write ketubot, then since there's nothing to rip up, that's why you have to write a receipt. So that's why the Mishnah said write a receipt. But we can't learn from this Mishnah that in all cases, even if there is a ketubah, that you have to write a receipt. Baruch Adonai leolam. Amen. Ve amen.